Today I'll be showing you this LED magnet matrix that I made. Yeah, you're wondering what is flickering on there? Oh wait, that's my fault. Since I made this display really fast, the animation is running at 2000 frames per second. So let's slow it down, maybe you can recognize it now. Anyways, besides the fast frame rates, it can achieve really high color depths or be easily connected to a bigger display. It has even more features under the hood, but as always I messed up this time as well. So I had to abuse some driver ICs, flip them upside down and solder them on in dead bug mode. So please enjoy! I purchased these RGB matrices probably around 10 years ago and as many components there are sitting on the shelf and taunting me. So around one and a half years ago, I decided I will make a board with those. And since they look like they could be tileable, I decided to use pogo pins and magnets to make them attach correctly, share power and communicate. The issue with the matrices is that the pins are quite close to the edge. So if you don't want to use a stack of PCBs, there is only a narrow space left to put on any connector. I wasn't able to find any magnetic connectors that would fit there. So I decided I will use those pogo pin blocks and embed some magnets in the case. I designed the board around a WCH RISC-V MCU. The 208 version has a lot of pins and is quite cheap. I added a USB-C connector, some power regulation, some buttons, a buzzer with a basic driver and even a MEMS microphone. The two layer PCB is quite packed, but still everything fit nicely there. On the back side I used GIMP to generate halftone graphics, which actually looks cool. I really didn't want to assemble those boards myself, so I ordered the assembly directly from JLCPCB, which is today's sponsor. You can upload your Gerber files and see directly how the board will look like. As always I choose the black and lead free option. There are plenty of features that you can choose from. For hobbies, the economic assembly is the best option, since there is not a lot that you need to care about. Choosing the assembly, you also need to upload your bomb file and the placement file. You can assign the parts from the huge JLC stock, but you can also skip a few parts that are not available, like in my case, the pogo pins. On the next page you will get a preview of the parts and how they will be placed. Using the spacebar you can just rotate the parts that need adjustment or correct the placement using the mouse. But you are typically also covered by the engineering team. They will contact you if something is wrong. So this whole assembly costs me around 66 bucks, which is about 12 per piece. So if you're interested to give them a try, check out the coupon codes from the description and their latest promotions on the website. They are also offering CNC and 3D printing services. After a few days the boards arrived and looked amazing. Oh, this is so cool. As you can see I skipped the through hole headers as well, since I need to solder on the pogo blocks first in this narrow space next to them. But quite soon I discovered the first problem testing the boards. The LED matrices didn't turn on at all. So I checked everything and discovered the first problem. While placing the drivers, I was moving them around, organizing the schematics. And at some point, I used X to flip the high side driver IC. That was stupid. Now the inputs and outputs were flipped. Oh wow, that needs a fix. One good thing about this driver is that the inputs and outputs are also positioned physically on the opposite sides. So if we take off the IC, bend down the legs and solder it on upside down, that might work, but there is one thing that we need to consider, the power pins can't be flipped. So I just leave them up in the air and use some botch wires to reconnect them to the board. Oh well, that looks like a viable fix. I just needed to do this a few times to actually have a set of matrices that I can attach to each other. While I'm at my soldering desk, I also solder on the pogo blocks. The programming pins and the pin headers. it. 
awesome cleaning in IPA and it's ready to be tested. It works now, that's really cool. As mentioned before, it is capable of displaying really high frame rates and really high color depths. And that was my intention from the beginning. And here is how it works. So this is an 8x8 matrix, but each of the LEDs has actually three LEDs internally, R, G and B. So it has 24 pins to address each LED color component of each column on the low side and 8 pins on the high side to address the row that's currently active. Usually such a matrix would be driven by shift registers that are controlled by the MCU. That's also happening on these matrices here. But you have to shift in the bits serially, which takes at least 24 times longer than setting all at once. And this is what I aimed for. We only need 32 pins to do this. But there is a slight problem. To drive a complete row of 8 LEDs, a 3 components, you need up to 480 milliamps. Not only this will probably exceed the limit of the MCU in total, all this power would need to be supplied by a single pin. And that usually is limited to around 20 milliamps. So the solution is to put some buffers in between. And there actually are parallel low side and high side buffers, which I also used here. With the 24 pins for the columns and the 8 pins for the rows, we need 32 pins in total and on this MCU we can set all the pins at once just by setting GPIO B and C with 16 pins each. So for a complete refresh of the 8 rows we only need 16 IO writes which is as fast as you can be here. I decided to use the system timer to refresh the rows of the display and then I tested with the oscilloscope what the highest refresh rate can be to update the display. At that time it was around 2.5 microseconds. But with optimizations and some added features that changed a little bit later. But what we end up with is 400,000 frames per second at 1 bit per color component. That's plenty of room to increase the color fidelity. But how do we do that? So usually we can only turn off or on an LED. But we can also divide a frame into subframes and turn on the LED for just a certain time. So this would be 0, this would be 1, this would be 2, and this would be 3. It looks familiar and it actually is PWM. So that would be a color fidelity of 2 bits already. That's 4 different states per color component, 64 colors in total and still 133,000 frames per second. So if we add more and more subframes, we can achieve at 8 bits, which is typical, still around 1.5 thousand frames per second. And at 12 bits, almost 100 FPS, which still looks good for the naked eye and brings a lot of color fidelity. But the problem that we have now is that we need to update the LEDs at the highest rate possible. That means that the MCU is constantly busy with the system timer interrupts. We could set along a time span, but we are updating 24 channels that all have individual values here. So that means that the MCU will be 100% busy only with refreshing the screen. So I thought maybe let's do it a little bit different. If you think of binary values, the highest significant bit occupies already half of the frame time and the second highest bit a quarter and so on and so on. So by activating the LEDs according to the bit planes, we can actually set the timer accordingly. And then during the interrupt we just check if the bit is set and activate the LEDs accordingly. What happens now is we divide and conquer and the interrupt is rarely called. For 8 bit it's 8 times instead of 256. And all the time, especially on the higher significant bits, is spare time for the MCU to do other stuff in the main loop. And this is a version how it's done in the code for this specific MCU. Just initializing the GPIOs, the system timer with the software interrupt, and this is how the subframe of the bit plane is displayed. Usually a pixel of the frame buffer would be set with the RGB components, but before displaying, will be converted to the individual frames that can be directly written to the I.O. ports. Anyways, code is boring, so let's take a look. 
Here you can see a little bit of this divide and conquer. Actually we start at the lowest significant bits with the highest frequency and then the updates get slower and slower. So at lower bit depths we can achieve quite high frame rates. They don't even really show on camera anymore. Usually that could be a problem. But trigger warning, if we increase the color fidelity to 13 or 14 bits, we get some mesmerizing effects. A common problem with LED displays is that the LEDs get quite bright quite quickly, so images need to be gamma corrected. Having a higher color depth there really helps. As you can see, we can turn on the LEDs really dimly now. Oh yes. That's 13 bits. That's the lowest brightness at 12 bits. That's 11 bits. 10 bits. This is 9 bits. And this is the lowest brightness at 8 bits. Which is quite a significant difference. So with around 100 frames per second, 12 bits is my favorite option. But there is also a slight problem. As you can see the lowest row is brighter than the other ones before. And this has to do with the high side driver. Unfortunately, that is not so fast. So we have some ghosting, which really would need to be addressed with the next revision, if that is ever happening. While testing on live stream, we came across a nice effect with a high shutter speed on the camera. You can actually see the individual bit planes. This is really sick. It looks like a green screen effect or something. But this is actually how we recorded it. That's strange, like wee 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 grit. And obviously the peeps on the live stream helped me to put on the rig on this device. Now that the LEDs are working, let's check out the magnet part shortly. First of all I needed a case around the PCB to also hold the magnets and keep it from shorting. I designed this already last year so it's still in Blender. <laughs> but it works for me. I printed it quickly and removed the built-in tabs from the buttons. This way I didn't need any support material. And it actually fits quite nicely. But this wasn't the first version, trust me on that. Since some of the connectors are proud, you really need to flex it around the PCB. But it fits! Now to the magnets. I just got some magnets off eBay and glued them in with hot glue. I got the polarity wrong a few times. Oh, shit. Ah. So let me show how I decided on finally to put it together. So the matrices are tileable if oriented the same way. We have male and female pogo connectors on the opposing sides. Of the four pins, two pins are for power. In this case, both connectors have plus and minus obviously on the same side. But transmit and receive are switched. So if the one matrix is sending anything, the other one is receiving it. This way they can share power and communicate. The magnets are embedded in the case. And they are not only necessary to keep the matrices together, but also to align it properly. So obviously the opposing sides that need to go together need the magnets to be oriented that way that they attract. But also if you rotate the matrix and try to connect it wrongly, they need to repel each other. So, and this is the functionality in action. One matrix is powered and the others get attached, share the power and also detect which side is connected to another matrix. But I'm not really satisfied with uh, this solution. The pogo pins are not really that stable here and quite often I lose the data or power connection. Anyways, it's quite cool, but I don't think I will try to make a product out of that. It's a nice showpiece. I'm running it at 12 bits currently, so I actually can dim it for the camera using one button and play Rickroll for you. It's a cool little project that I had a lot of fun with, especially testing what crazy frame rates we can achieve with that. 1.9 kilo frames per second. <laughs> The magnety thing is quite cool if you want to impress people on Kickstarter, but not really great as it is right now. I have a different project that is more promising on that side. I hope you found this interesting and maybe even got inspired a little bit. Thank you to JLC for sponsoring this project. Big thanks to all my supporters on Patreon, GitHub, 
YouTube memberships or even PayPal. I'm really grateful and it makes a difference. Thank you for watching and I see you next time. Bye.